All right, Hotep, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Sunday, April 17th, 2022. And we are live. So I, I, originally I was not scheduled to broadcast today. The radio station is shut down uh because it's easter sunday so normally my show is on sundays 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern standard time but so since the radio station was shut down i wasn't going to broadcast today i have other things scheduled to do but because this is easter easter sunday and because of the facebook post that i did earlier today and it's got over 300 likes and it's gotten hundreds of comments i said okay so look i'm going to come on and we'll do a quick broadcast it's gotten 125 comments so far so far um but 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 um so i said i'm gonna come on and uh talk briefly about east the origins of easter pagan traditions rabbits laying chicken eggs and african americans all right so share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. Turn on live notifications when you uh, so you know when we go live. Follow us at The African History Network on Facebook and Michael M. Hotep on YouTube, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. All right. Now, I have to I have some slides to show you, Paul, because I was working on the, my PowerPoint presentation before I came on um so i've talked about the history of easter going back to like 2011 i was referencing i went through my archives i was looking at some of my notes going back to 2011 dealing with the history of christmas now i mean history of easter history of easter now i'm not telling anybody don't celebrate easter okay but what i'm saying is we should at least know the history of what it is that we are celebrating okay i'm not telling somebody don't celebrate easter but we should at least know the history of what it is that we're celebrating and just as when i talk about celebrating christmas or saint patrick's day things like this i have to reference you know dr shaka musa barashango in his two books, African People and European Holidays and Mental Genocide, book one and book two, because in these books, he goes through and breaks down the history of all these European holidays that we have been taught to celebrate, okay? So I'm not saying don't celebrate Easter, okay? I'm saying we should at least know the history behind, like the historical origins behind what it is we've been taught to celebrate, okay? and i know i may say some things that are outside the circumference of some people's awareness so i'm just gonna go ahead and do uh my disclaimer that i usually do when i deal with quote unquote controversial uh information like this and i learned this from one of my teachers dr ray hagans um let me pull this up here um so i usually when I do my presentations and uh, when I do lectures, especially in front of mixed audiences, things like this, um, I know I may say some things that are, that are outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what it is that I'm talking about. So I usually have people put their fingers together to form a circle. And I usually say something like this, the space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exists outside the circumference of my own awareness. Now, the reason why I say this, and, and if you ever see me do lectures, especially in person, I usually say something like this because people come to these different presentations with different levels of understanding of history. Okay. And I mean, half our people still think Willie Lynch historically existed, which goes to another uh, Facebook post I did today dealing with the fact that Willie Lynch 
is fictitious and the Willie Lynch letter is a fraud and Willie Lynch never historically existed. And some of our people can't give it up and turn it loose. Like Invoke said, Invoke said, give it up and turn it loose. Some of our people just want to hold on to these myths for whatever reason. I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but it, they don't want to deal with real history. They want to hold on to myths. So just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean that you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness. And I learned that from uh, uh, Dr. Ray Hagens. Now, here is the Facebook post that I did today, this morning. And um, got a bigger response than I thought it would get. And people are still liking it and commenting on it. Let me go to it right here. Uh, hold on. Where is it? Uh, this right here. Okay. So, um, so far as I'm like 346 likes and 125 comments. We did this on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and on my personal page, Michael M. Hotep. So, I said Easter is a movable Christian holiday because a lot of people don't know what determines when Easter is celebrated. It's usually on a different Sunday each year. OK, a lot of people don't know why it's a different Sunday, why it's a movable feast, what determines when Easter is celebrated. So Easter is a movable Christian holiday. It is, it is celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. And I'm going to pull this up uh, also here. Let's see. I'm going to pull this slide up so it'll be easier for you to see it. You can check this out on our Facebook fan page and, and the African History Network and comment if you want to. Um, okay, let me see. I think if I do it this way, it'll be easier for you to see it. Let's do it like this. Okay. All right. So Easter is a movable Christian holiday. It is celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. The vernal equinox marks the first day of spring. Vernal in Latin means spring. And equinox comes from aquanatium, which means equal night. The vernal equinox is the day of the year where you have the same amount of daylight as sun as uh, day, same amount as daylight as nighttime. So it's usually March 20th, March 21st. That marks the first day of spring, the vernal equinox. Spring has nothing to do with a rodent seeing its shadow or not seeing its shadow. The groundhog spring has nothing to do when spring comes has nothing to do with the groundhog seeing its shadow or not seeing its shadow. Now, the vernal equinox marks the first day of spring, which usually comes March 20th or March 21st. When Easter is celebrated, is based upon astronomy. To determine when Easter is celebrated is based upon astronomy. And this was one of the results of the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD. One of the 21 ecumenical councils held between 325 AD and 1870. Okay, that's history. You can you can look up Easter in an encyclopedia or dictionary, and it would tell you when Easter is celebrated, what that's determined by. It's determined by astronomy. OK, now, um, if we go and look here at uh, if we start looking at this briefly, then there are going to be some articles that I reference as well. OK. Um, so when we look at the history of Easter, we're going to look at what are called, we're going to look at some of the pre-Christian celebrations and pre-Christian holidays surrounding Easter or what people call pagan traditions, okay, or what people call pagan traditions. Um, just a second here. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide here. Uh, and you're going to deal with the uh, goddess Istra and Ostara. 
okay germanic goddesses associated with spring and fertility depending upon which european language you're looking at you may see some see some different variations in the spelling of their names also we're going to talk a little bit about the passover story as well in the exodus of jews or hebrews out of egypt and when you actually understand the story and the average um size of a jew hebrew family back then you know this you're talking about approximately a million and a half to two million people wandering wandering in the desert for 40 years okay we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that because i ain't trying to make this long and drawn out so easter is a movable feast what determines when easter is celebrated why is it on a different uh a different day each year uh we talked a little bit about that already so if we look at american heritage dictionary we're going to look at some different sources if we look at american heritage dictionary easter e-a-e-a-s-t-e-r is a christian feast commemorating the resurrection of jesus or yeshua now there's been a shift over the past few years to refer to it more as resurrection day as opposed to easter because some christians realize the quote unquote pagan origins secular celebrations the easter bunny uh easter eggs rabbits laying chicken eggs right there should confuse people they say why are you dealing with rabbits laying chicken eggs rabbits don't lay chicken eggs but okay um so you re hear it referred to as resurrection sunday but a lot of people don't even know why it's celebrated on a different sunday each year so Easter is the most significant Christian holiday, okay, out of all the Christian holidays. Even though Christmas is probably the most commercial, Easter is the most significant, okay? It, it commemorates the resurrection of, of Yeshua, Yeshua uh, ben Yosef, or, or what they call Jesus. The letter J didn't exist until 1630 AD, okay? The letter J is derived from, from the letter I, and the letter J did not always exist. So the letter J uh, didn't exist in 1630 AD. So when you look up the word Jesus in the dictionary and you go to, you can use Webster or what have you, you can use etymological dictionaries, the etymological dictionaries that I use, especially when I teach my online history classes, uh, it takes you back to Yeshua, okay? So, this deals with if we look up uh jesus and i did this recently in one of my classes um let me see here we got this yeah okay so if we look at this here so this is one of the online is um etymological encyclopedias that i use or etymological dictionaries etym online etym online.com e-t-y M O E T Y M online.com. And you do, they're done with word origins. Okay. So if you look up the word Jesus uh, in the etymological dictionary, or you, you can go to Webster. Webster is on, uh, uh, Webster dictionary is on um, online. You can go to Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm on Brit uh, Britannica's website very often because i pay them a subscription each month because i use them when i teach my classes so if you look at the word jesus it takes you back to uh it's from late latin iesus with an i iesus with an i uh from the greek uh iosu is 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 um iesus i'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that i e s o u s Okay, so you go from the late Latin Iesus to I, Isus, uh, Greek, I-E-S-O-U-S, which is an attempt to render into Greek the Aramaic Semitic proper name, Jeshua, Hebrew, Yeshua, or Yahshua, which means Jah is salvation which means Jah is salvation, but it, it takes you back to the Hebrew, Yeshua with a Y, because the letter J didn't exist. 
when the when the bible was written not the, not the when the bible was written the letter j didn't exist and then if you look in the holy quran the prophet's name is isa with an i because when the quran was written the letter j didn't exist okay so you go through and go through and read the rest of this here all right so you so we're dealing with the um the english variation of coming from late latin greek hebrew all right so check that out now if we go to um let's go back to the powerpoint presentation here so easter a christian feast commemorating the resurrection of yeshua or jesus in english the day on which this feast is observed the first sunday following the full moon that occurs on or next after the vernal equinox now this is from american heritage dictionary explaining to you that what determines when easter celebrated is based upon astronomy which was one of the in results of the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Then it tells you Middle English, Esther, from Old English, Eastra, E E A S T R E, Eastra. Okay, so we need to look at these, we need to study the etymology of these words that all it also teaches us history at the same time. All right, so let's continue here. Now, what is Easter? Easter is a Christian holiday that celebrates the belief in the resurrection of Yeshua or Jesus the Christ. Now they say Jesus Christ, but it's actually Jesus the Christ. Okay, because Christ is a title, not a name. Christ coming from Christos, the Greek Christos means anointed or anointed one coming from the uh comedic or the metal netter ka rest k-a-r-s-t ka rest meaning the rising of the spirit ka rest okay this is where this comes from now in the new testament of the helios biblos the sun book or the holy bible in the new testament the event is said to have occurred three days after Jesus was crucified by the Romans and died in roughly uh, 30 AD, died in roughly 30 AD. OK, now the so even now this is um, from history.com official website of the History Channel, Easter 20, 2022. OK. And they're talking about Easter. It's talking about uh, um, a brief synopsis of Easter. But if you look at, uh, I was looking at BibleGateway.com uh, yesterday because I was watching a um, presentation. And if you look at First uh, Corinthians. Uh, let me see here, BibleGateway.com. Um, it's in the, um, let me see, it's in the, not the King James Version. Yeah, first Corinthians 15, uh, 15, 4. First Corinthians, uh, chapter 15, verse 4. Okay, right here. Okay, let me pull this up because I'm in Google Chrome. I have it up in uh, Firefox, but I'm in Google Chrome right now because I was just looking at this yesterday. New International Version, NIV, first Corinthians 15, 4. And that he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Okay, rose again on the third day. All right. Um, okay, let's continue here.
All right. So the holiday uh, concludes the Passion of Christ, a series of events, and uh, begins with Lent, a 40-day period of fasting, prayer, and sacrifice, and ends with Holy Week, which includes Holy Thursday, the celebration of Jesus' Last Supper with his 12 apostles, also known as Maundy Thursday. Uh, then you have Good Friday, on which Yeshua was crucified. The crucifixion of Yeshua is obser observed. And Easter Sunday. Although a holiday of high religious significance in the Christian faith, many traditions associated with Easter date back to pre-Christian pagan times. Now, this is history.com official website of the history channel um that breaks this down and they make the relationship and i looked at numerous sources on this you look at britannica you look at this article here from time.com you could look at i've got stuff i printed up back in 2011 from when answers.com existed now it's encyclopedia.com they referenced 200 encyc online encyclopedias when you go study this history it takes you back to pre-Christian origins, especially what are called pagan traditions, especially what are called pagan traditions. So we'll talk about pagan in just a minute. Because pagan doesn't necessarily mean something negative. It's just it 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 has taken on a negative taint. It has taken on a negative uh, uh, tone. All right. Uh, so the, and this is like these are some of my notes here. OK, so this is when answers.com existed. I, I printed this up April 12th, 2011, because I have hundreds of articles going back to actually thousands, really thousands going back over the years. But I'm just looking at stuff that I printed up from answers.com and MSN and Carter. MSN and Carter doesn't even exist. I've got binders of historical information from MSN and Carter. But this is this is 35 pages. This all deals with the history of Easter from different online encyclopedias, different sources. OK, this is when answers.com existed and the Gale Encyclopedia of Food and Culture has some good information. Now, encyclopedia.com took over from answers.com. So encyclopedia.com, they reference about 200 different online encyclopedias on all different topics. OK, so if we go back here to uh, this right here. All right, so we have just a basic understanding of the Easter celebration, the largest, the, the most important uh, celebration in most important holiday in Christianity. Now, in Eastern Orthodox Christianity, in Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which adheres to the Julian calendar, not the Gregorian calendar. Uh, Orthodox Easter falls on Sunday between April 4th and May 8th each year. Now, in some denominations of Protestant Christianity, and we know about the Protestant Reformation 1517 with Martin Luther, and when we deal with the um, when we deal with the uh, councils of Trent, the three councils of Trent from about 1545 to 1563. Uh, the councils of Trent were designed to, one of the reasons why they were convened was to deal with the fallout from the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Church losing so many people because of the Protestant Reformation, okay? We'll talk about the third council of Trent, 1563 in just a minute. So in some denominations of Protestant Christianity, Easter Sunday marks the beginning of Easter tide or the Easter's or the Easter season, also called Easter tide. Easter tide ends on the 50th day after Easter, which is known as Pentecost Sunday. Penta in reference to five, Pentecost Sunday. Okay. Now in Eastern Orthodox branches, Easter Sunday serves as the start of the season of Pasha, which is Greek for Passover, 
which ends 40 days later with the holiday known as the Feast of the Ascension. Okay, so what determines when Easter celebrated? Okay, we talk about the first Sunday following the first full moon, following the vertical equinox. Well, when did they come up with that? So the complicated, um, the complicated date, dating for Easter was set in 325 AD at the first council of Nicaea, which scheduled the festival to be celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon occurring next after the vernal equinox, right about March 21st. Okay. Uh, however, if the full moon occurs on the Sunday, Easter will be celebrated the following Sunday. Hence the date, hence the date of Easter can fluctuate between March 22nd and April 25th, okay? This is the period of time that Easter happens between March 22nd and April 25th. Because the Western churches, because the Western churches, Catholic and Protestant now follow the Gregorian calendar introducing 1582 A.D. by Pope uh, Gregory the Thirteenth, but Pope, uh, Pope Gregory, Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, uh, in um, 1582, Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, let's say 1582 A.D. Because the Western churches, Catholic and Protestant, now follow the Gregorian calendar, the Eastern churches, which follow the unrevised Julian calendar, celebrate Easter and other church holidays on different dates. In Orthodox, um, in the Orthodox Church, Easter marks the beginning of the ecclesiastical year. Okay, you can reference um, Encyclopedia.com uh, in the the uh information they have on easter but also the gale encyclopedia g-a-l g-a-l-e the gale encyclopedia on um food and culture it has information on easter the origins of easter what determines when easter is celebrated things like this okay now let's continue how's everybody doing also, I'll give you information about the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays as well. We have uh, class number one of ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade starting up uh, Saturday, April 23rd. It's going to be 2 p.m. to uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's a 10 week online class that I teach. Now, where does the name Easter come from? Where does the name Easter come from? Okay, so when you study history and you study the dating systems of AD and BC, AD meaning Anno Domini in the year of our Lord, BC meaning before Christ, you, you, you'll read about St. Bede, the Venerable, also referred to as the Venerable Bede, B-E-D-E. -E. He was a 8th century Christian monk, okay, or they may say Christian priest. But St. Bede the Venerable, the 8th century author of Ecclesiastical History of the English People, maintains that the English word Easter, E-A-S-T-E-R, comes from Eostre, E-O-S-T-R-E, or Eostre, E-O-S-T-R-A-E, the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility. The Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility, e, um, Eostra or Eostre, however you pronounce it. And she was associated with spring and fertility, spring dealing with rebirth, things growing again. OK, other historians maintain. Uh, the uh, other historians maintain the, uh, that Easter derives from um, uh, in albus, a Latin phrase that's plural for alba or dawn, D-A-W-N, dawn, that becomes Easterum in Old High German, E-O-S-T-A-R-U-M. 
a precursor to the English language of today. Now, despite its significance as a Christian holiday or holy day, many of the traditions and symbols that play a key role in Easter, in, in Easter observances, actually have roots in pagan celebrations, particularly the pagan goddess Eostra and in the Jewish holiday of Passover. Now, this is from history.com in their piece on Easter. OK, so when you start studying this history, it takes you into different areas and it takes you into different cultures and different languages. All right. And you start dealing with the the, the pre Christian origin. Same thing with Christmas. The origins of Christmas is one of the most is probably the most fascinating of all, all the all these European holidays we've been taught to celebrate. And I've been studying the history of Christmas going back to probably 2010, something like that. All right, so what does the word pagan mean? Because we keep hearing this word pagan, right? And we've been taught to, we've been taught that pagan is something negative. So what does the word pagan mean? Pagan is a word that is misused to speak negatively about a group of people, especially it's used when you talk about non-Christian people or you talk about uh in pre-christian history okay and they talk about ancient africans and they talk about ancient egyptians and things that they were pagan and all this stuff like this right to to demean them to denigrate them but at the same time europeans steal aspects of african history and culture for their own benefit and try to claim it as their own so the american heritage dictionary defines pagan as an adherent of a polytheistic religion in antiquity, especially when viewed in contrast to an adherent of a monotheistic religion. But see, the problem is, is that when you study traditional African spiritual systems, even though they had different emissaries and different helpers of the creator, you know, Olo du Marais the, 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 uh, in uh, the Orisha or, um, emissaries and manifestations of the one supreme force, Olodumare amongst the Yoruba and Ifa. You have Amun Ra, Amun Ra Patah, the, the supreme being uh, God in, in uh, when you deal with ancient Kemet, things like this. They have different helpers, different emissaries, different manifestations, the Netaru, the different forces of nature, the different manifestations of that one supreme force. But you have the same thing, Christianity. Because the angels are helpers of, of, uh, of the creator, of God in Christianity. And the, and the saints or patron saints are going to replace the Netaru in Christianity. So when you look at, for instance, if we go and look at um, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder, and I actually um deal with a lot of this in in the online classes that i teach but if we look here briefly at um okay do we want to get let's see do i want to get that deep into it let's let's okay let's just let's just keep it simple um let's just, let's just keep it simple let's look at this right here this is from page um this is now about the contributions to civilization was this page 163. Oh, I think it's 163 now about the contributions to civilization. And Browder is showing how the Greeks and Romans, um, how the Greeks and Romans, their deities were influenced by the deities in ancient Kemet. So he talks about Dehuti. And Dehuti, uh, you see here, number one, Dehuti is the ibis-headed netter coming out of ancient Kemet, who is the deity of divine articulation of speech, um, writing, measurement, things like this. And Dehuti 
is depicted with a staff holding a staff, two staffs that have a snake wrapped around each staff. And one snake and, and one uh snake is wearing the uh crown of upper Kemet, the other snake is wearing the crown of lower Kemet. Okay, so we see the Houthi. And if we let me see, let's advance to the next slide here. Uh so it says Dahuti, the netter of science, writing, measurement, divine articulation of speech and medicine, holds in his hand two staffs with entwined snakes. One serpent wears the crown of upper Kemet, the other wears the crown of lower Kemet. Dahuti was referred to as Thoth by the Greeks. Okay. Then the second one he showed you in the middle, the deity in the second is Hermes. Uh, who was the Greek equivalent of Dahuti? Okay, so Hermes. We see Hermes with the winged feet, and we see the Her Hermes is carrying a staff over his left shoulder. Okay, so Hermes is the Greek equivalent of Dahuti. So when we look at the attributes of Hermes, because all these deities have attributes. The same thing when we look at the angels in Christianity who are helpers of God. Okay, you have different types of angels. You have warrior angels like Michael. You have messenger angels like uh, uh, Gabriel. Okay, and then we're going to talk about patron saints in a minute because the patron saints in Christianity who also have different attributes replace the Netaru. Now, Hermes was the Greek equivalent of Dahuti, who was shown carrying a staff with two entwined snakes. It was called the Staff of Hermes. In Greek mythology, Hermes was associated with wisdom and the Hermetic sciences were named in his honor. And in the Hermetic sciences, Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus, that is essential to when we deal with Freemasonry, and we know Freemasonry, the foundation of Freemasonry, comes out of ancient Kemet and the Nile Valley region of Africa. And it's the African Moors who take the teachings from ancient Kemet into Europe in 711 AD. And they're going to teach this to Europeans to our detriment because everything we taught Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. Now, the third, the third deity that you have here is Mercury. Okay. Amongst the Romans, even though he says Greek here, but it's Mercury amongst the Romans. They may have had Mercury with the Greeks, but it's basically with the Romans. Mercury is the Roman version of Hermes and Dahuti, and he is similar in all aspects. The staff that Mercury carries is called the Caduceus, and it has been adopted as the universal symbol of medicine. So when you look at the caduceus, do I have the caduceus here? Hold on, let me see. Yeah, right here. When we look at the caduceus and variations of the caduceus, you're looking at African culture. This comes straight from us. They stole our stuff, represented it as their own, made it seem like they created this stuff in the first place. These, these are culture bandits and then represented to the world like they created it themselves. You look right here, Arizona Latin American Medical Association. These are slides I created myself. I went and researched this. The, the American Medical Association has a, has a stick with one snake wrapped around it. That's a variation of the caduceus. Right here, the Arizona Latin American Medical Association, you see the two snakes wrapped around. You see the staff with the wings of Ra and the sun disc. Just straight out of African culture. Then you look at the uh, this uh, dentist association, dentistry. They have the stick. They have the staff with a snake wrapped around it. Straight out of Africa. And then we've been taught to hate who we are, love who we can't be, while they're still in our culture. And then represented to the world like they created it themselves. Okay, so when we look at, so, so we see that this comes from ancient Kemet now. We go go even deeper, and then I'm gonna get right back to Easter. But this is still right on the same subject. To go even deeper, we look. We talk about Dahuti, right? 
And let me see, is this the right slide? Is this the right, do I have, because I have it blown up. Hold on, where is it where I have it blown up? Um, it's in, oh, I know what it is. It's in um, another presentation. Hold on. Let me show you this. Okay, so um, let me pull this up here. Looking at the Houthi. What I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Okay, just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you may have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. So when we talk about the um, the concept of the virgin birth, the adoration, and the uh, the virgin birth and the the adoration, the immaculate conception, things like this, right? These are these are ancient African principles. And let me try to open this back up. Okay, here we go. These are ancient African principles. And a lot of this we've been taught to run away from. Okay, we've been taught to run away from it. And, and just to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to say this as del delicately as I can. We, we have to understand the difference between world history and religious literature. OK, just to, just to say it as delicately as I can. We have to understand the difference between world history and religious literature. OK. Um, world history is what happened, when it happened, how it happened, who, what, when, why, where, how, the names of the people, things like this. Historical events, places, times, dates, things like this. This is world history. OK. World history is in world history books. Religious literature and world history are not the same thing. Okay, world history is in world history books. Religious literature is in religious literature. Okay, so I'm not saying don't believe what you don't believe, but I'm saying you have to know where to look for what it is that you are searching for. OK, so we have to you ever go you ever go to historical museums. You ever go to historical museums and they have, um, you know, they, they have uh, uh, statues and artifacts and things like this from ancient Africa or West Africa or what have you. Or they have them from Europe. Uh, they have them from China, different things like this. Right. When you go to historical museums, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Do you ever wonder why you don't see biblical characters in historical museums? I mean, <laughs> I mean, now, if, they, if they do have biblical characters in historical museums, it's like it's like the biblical section. OK, they may have a statue of the Virgin Mary. And the information they say may say, according to the Bible, such and such. But usually when you go to historical museums, they usually don't have biblical characters there. You may find an exception here and there, but the overwhelming majority, 95, 98, 99% of what you see in historical museums is not biblical characters. Okay, so... Uh, we have to understand the difference. Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We have to understand the difference. Doesn't mean that there aren't truths in religious texts and things like this. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying world history is in world history books. Religious literature is something different. Even though they talk about occurrences in different parts of the world that exist, Egypt and Jerusalem and, and things like this, right? That's that's how people get confused. So if you look here at page 95, very quickly, now belly contributions to civilization, because I really ain't playing here to be this long. Uh, 
really didn't plan to be here this long, but uh, page 95, Browder talks about um, the story of Asara Arset and Heru is the first story in the recorded history of a man of a holy royal family, the Trinity, the Trinity, immaculate conception, virgin birth, and resurrection. Immaculate conception, virgin birth, and resurrection. Evidence of this trinity is known to have existed in ancient Nubia or Tanahesi as late as 3300 BCE, before the common era, before Christ, 3300 years before the common era, before Christ, at least. To have known is is to known to have existed in ancient Nubia at as late as oh, sorry, as late as thirty three hundred BCE. This is a, a a ancient story that's retold over and over and over and over again, adapted to various people's cultures. Read all the stories. That's fine. I'm not saying don't read that one. Read this one. Read all the stories. That's fine. Carved on the walls of the temple of Luxor, circa 1380 BCE, before the common era or before Christ, are the scenes which depict the following. One, the Annunciation. The Netter Dehuti, who we just talked about, okay, Dehuti, who had the two staffs with a snake wrapped around each staff who's the, who's the, the netter, a divine articulation of speech is also the netter that records in the book, the results of when your heart is weighed against the feather of Ma'at when you die on the, on the, at the judgment scene. And when your heart is weighed on the scales of Ma'at. Okay. That's another conversation. The Annunciation, the netter Dehuti, is shown announcing to the virgin all set the coming of their uh, the coming of um uh, heru okay let me see let's go back to this here okay the the netro the Houthi is shown announcing to the virgin all set the coming birth of their son heru who the greeks called Horus. Number two, the Immaculate Conception. The, the, so, uh, so the bottom, the bottom, you see one, two, panel one, two, three, four. Okay. So you see the Netta de Huti, the, with, the, with the Ibis head, the, the head of the Ibis bird, announcing to Osset, the virgin, who the Greeks called Isis, the coming birth of their son Heru. Then the second panel, you, the Immaculate Conception. The Netter Nef, K N E P H, who represents the Holy Ghost, and the Netter Het Heru, who the Greeks called Hathor, are shown symbolically impregnating all set by holding the onks, which is the African symbol of eternal life or the African key of life, the onk, A N K H, holding the onk to her nostrils. Of the virgin mother to be. They are symbolically impregnating all set. The virgin. Now, when you look at the constellation of Virgo, when you study astronomy and you look at the constellation of Virgo, Virgo is called the virgin. But the word Virgo is Latin for virgin. The word Virgo is Latin for virgin. In ancient times, the constellation of Virgo was the constellation of Osset, the virgin. So if we go back and look, and then panel number three at the top, panel number three, the virgin birth. Osset is shown sitting on the birthing stool and the newborn child is attended by midwives. 
because we we knew that it made more sense to sit on the birthing stool and let gravity take its course than lay on your back and try to push the baby out and then number four at the bottom the adoration the adoration the newborn heru is is portrayed receiving gifts from three kings or magi while being adored by a host of gods and men does any of this sound familiar and we know in the helios biblos of some book it doesn't tell how many wise men the, the three is in reference to the three stars in orion's belt orion the hunter the three stars in orion's belt and then the star sirius which was the star in the east that in the story of the wise men the three wise men they said they follow a star in the east but when you look at when you, they said they see they said they came from the orient in the story they said they came from the orient and they they were headed to uh bethlehem okay and they follow the star in the east so that's the that's the uh star sirius which is in the constellation of canis major the big dog the 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 the, the big dog uh the star sirius the dog star and um now the problem is is that um bethlehem and where they were headed is to the west of the orient so why would you see a star in the east and go west i mean this is it's, this is the, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness this is this is the this is a story okay this is this is a story so it's a higher meaning to the story it's an allegory something like that but it's a story when you look at a map bethlehem is to the west of the orient so why would you see a star in the east and go west and they're on camelback we ain't gonna we're not gonna get into the distance that they had to travel on camelback but you know anyway <laughs> read read christianity before christ but dr john g jackson also which gets deep into a lot of this history in the pre-christian origin and where a lot of these stories come from then it deals with the different crucified saviors as well Okay, Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson. Kersey Gray's book, uh, The World's 16 Crucified Saviors, does it also. He deals with about 27 crucified saviors as well. Um, so check that out. Okay. So this is a retelling of our ancient story that goes throughout different cultures and the names for change and things like this, right? Now, in the... Um, in the uh christian story just as it was dahuti who delivered the annunciation to the virgin all set that she was going to give birth to heru okay in the uh christian story it is uh gabriel uh i'm sorry is gabriel is gabriel the messenger angel who delivers the message to the Virgin Mary that she's going to give birth to Yeshua. So as, as, as we looked at uh, the chart here from, let me see, I'm flipping between right here. As we looked at the chart here from page 168, now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. You go from Dahuti in ancient Kemet to Hermes in Greek, Mercury in Rome, and uh, Gabriel, the messenger angel who delivers the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary, just like Dahuti delivered the Annunciation to Osset. Okay, now when we look at patron saints very quickly to understand the connection between all this, because we see as they go through different um, cultures, they're taking different aspects from African spirituality 
infusing it into different European cultures. And we see this with we see this with the deities. Now, if we look here at uh, let me see, I want to go. Oh, I didn't want to close that out. If we look here at I want to go to. This next, yeah, right here. So this little chart right here shows how different deities from ancient Kemet, African deities, get incorporated into Greek mythology, then Roman mythology, and how these different, they, they do a comparative analysis between these different deities, and it shows how they have this, the, the same aspects. So if you look at Amun, okay, who is who is the creator of Amun or Amun Ra, Amen, Amun Ra. This is where the word I'm I'm a man, what they call it, say a man or Amen comes from. That's in Christianity. That comes from ancient Kemet. Amun in Greece, in, in, in the Greek mythology, Zeus would be the equivalent. When you study Zeus in Greek mythology, they tell you Zeus comes from Ethiopia. Because Zeus was originally African. Zeus was originally black. Okay. It's going to be later that he gets depicted as a European. Zeus, in, in Greek mythology, they tell you Zeus comes from Ethiopia, just like Hercules was black in Greek mythology. In Rome, you have Jupiter, and they, they are the ruler of the deities. Okay. The ruler of the gods, ruler of the deities. Uh, Bess, uh, in ancient Kemet, Dionysus, uh, in Greek, in Bacchus, in Rome, god of wine and reckless behavior. Dahuti, Thoth, Hermes, Greek, Mercury, Rome, messenger of the gods and god of science. Het Heru, Hathor, in ancient Kemet, Aphrodite in Greek, in Greece, Venus in Rome, goddess of love and beauty. Heru or Horus, in amongst the Greek and Romans, Apollo, the son of God, also associated with light and the sun. And a lot of depictions that you see of Jesus, he has a sun disc behind his head. Imhotep, ancient Kemet, Asclepius in Greece, and Asclepius in Rome, God of healing. Neat in ancient Kemet, in Greece, Athena, Rome, Minerva, goddess of crafts, war, and wisdom. Okay, so lastly, we look at patron saints to tie all this together. What's a patron saint? Because when you, when you, when you, when you look at what happened with Christianity, they removed the, the Neturu, from ancient Kemet, they removed those deities, replaced them with the patron saints because the, the Neturu were said to have watched over groups of people. Different cities had a different deity that they said watched over them and protect them in addition to the supreme force, the supreme being, okay? Well, that's the same thing that you have in Christianity with patron saints, just like that, just like Saint Maurice was a patron saint who, who was a more Saint Maurice, he was a patron saint to Germany. What's a patron saint? We look at we look at Britannica Concise Encyclopedia. Well, you could pick your source that you want to look at for patron saints. A saint whose protection and intercession, a person, society, church, place profession or activity is dedicated the choice is usually made on the basis of some real or presumed relationship for example saint patrick is the patron saint of ireland because he is credited with introducing christianity there even though he was a mass murderer and killed a lot to kill the druids and kill the irish people killed thousands of them he was a mass murderer he was sent in for go watch the presentation i did dealing with the history of of saint patrick's day and saint patrick an african-american celebrating saint patrick's day honoring a mass murderer
Okay. So St. Patrick was a patron saint to Ireland. Then you look at uh, um, St. Nicholas. Okay. St. Nicholas. Well, originally St. Nicholas was, was black. He was African because a lot of your early Christian saints were African saints. A lot of your early Christian saints were African saints and Christianity prior to the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD early Christianity looks a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. Also it's at these ecumenical councils where they're going to change what is believed, what is taught, what is written, all the, the all that stuff gets changed at the ecumenical councils. But you have St. Maurice, the Moor, patron saint of Germany, St. Patrick of Ireland, St. Nicholas, who, who is a patron saint of Amsterdam and, and Russia. But St. Nicholas is also a patron saint to uh, children, prostitutes, pawnbrokers, money lenders, uh, uh, seamen, navy men, things like this. St. Nicholas was a patron saint to all those people. St. Benedict the Moor of Par uh, Palermo in uh, San Frantello, uh, Sicily. He's also called Il Moro, which, uh, Italian for dark-skinned, okay? He was a patron saint as well. So when you look at the patron saints, the patron saints replaced the Netaru. This is uh, some original depictions of St. Nicholas. Who the um, the secular character, the mythological character of Santa Claus is a combination of center class coming from the Dutch, okay, and then also combining with the real Saint Saint Nicholas, because center class is Dutch, which means Saint Nicholas. OK, it, we, so we, we, you do it. You do it. Um, you, you do it with um, central class um, and uh, Joie de Piet, Black Pete, the Moor, who was his helper or in some versions of the story. Um, he would uh, Joie de Piet was enslaved. OK, so. You get into this history, you get into the history of the Moors, the you, you get into evidence of. The history of the Moors in Europe. But who was St. Nicholas, Greek Orthodox bishop, born in 280 AD in Myra, present day Turkey? Um, born to uh, wealthy uh, parents and gave away his inheritance to the poor, patron saint to children. Uh, pa patron saint to, uh, to children, seamen, prostitutes, pawnbrokers, palm, palm etc. Read uh, Christmas, Miscella Christmas Miscellany by Jonathan Green, pages 40 and 63 through 64. He deals with some of the myths um, about uh, St. Nicholas, okay? There's one myth about him saving some boys uh, who were uh, stuck in a barrel. Uh, there's another myth about him saving some girls from prostitution. Um, right. Okay. All right. Let's continue here. Now, also, if you like this type of information, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like. Um, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. That helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Um, and then we have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. Um, we have the, if you've been watching my show, you know I, I talked about the fake African History Network Cash App accounts out there. So I've made progress. Cash App is launching an investigation into them. I was actually able to get correspondence uh, with the, the right people at Cash App. So... Uh, I'm making progress on that. This is an official cash app account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. When you go to it, it says Michael and shows my picture there. We have the link here and our PayPal button. And then also uh, our 10
week online class is starting up uh, Saturday, April 23rd, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, they didn't teach you in school. Class number one starts up 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday, April 23rd. We do a three years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch it anytime. A year from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. Okay. So we have the information on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. The second class that I teach is From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. That's on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. We have a new session of that starting up also. And we have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for $120. That's a $260 value. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. You get a 50% discount uh, on the courses in the bundle pack. Okay, let's continue. Okay, somebody asked a question. Can you tell me the name of those books again? Um, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. And uh, at the beginning, we talked about African people and European holidays and mental genocide by Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango, book one and book two, where he goes through and breaks down the history of all these European holidays we've been taught to celebrate. So once again, I'm not I'm not saying don't celebrate the holidays. What I'm saying is we should at least know the history of what it is that we're celebrating Uh so that you are informed because many of us have not been taught the history of these holidays we've been taught to celebrate and if you do choose to continue to celebrate it after you understand the history what it is that you're celebrating it will probably change how you participate in it because you'll be more educated okay now uh let's continue i'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint presentation here just a second um let me pull this back up okay so that's uh patron saint and then if you're not familiar with joie de piet black pete this is a depiction of black pete right here uh joie de piet joie de meaning dark or swarthy and this is uh celebrated in holland okay right around uh, from November to um, part of November and then going up to December 5th or 6th, they have these celebrations of Joie de Piet, Black Pete, in Holland. And you have Europeans putting on blackface. And they say that uh, uh, the center class is in, in Black Pete, they're coming on a steamboat from Spain. They're coming on a steamboat from Spain, okay? Uh, well, Spain is where you was the Iberian Peninsula, and that's where uh, the Moors conquered. And that's where they go in in 711 AD, Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula, and they conquer, and you know they settle in Al Andalus, the southern portion of uh, Spain. If you look very quickly here. If you look at this article from the Washington Post, center class and Joie de Piet while holiday has me talking to my kids about blackface. They um, they show center class here on this on this boat with white people in blackface, pretending to be Joie de Piet the more, and they put on red lipstick and Afro wigs, things like this. Okay. And they, they're coming to uh, the Netherlands, but they're coming from Spain. The tradition is this, on the second Saturday of November, Joie de Piet, Black Pete, arrives in the Netherlands. Hold on, let me go back to this, where is it here? On the second Saturday of November, Joie de Piet, Black Pete, arrives in the Netherlands um on a steamboat from spain on a steamboat from spain along with center class a towering thin and plushly dressed figure hundreds of people gather to watch the steamboat arrive 
with the Piets dancing and waving while brass band music plays until center class disembarks on the white horse with the Piets walking at his side to greet and offer treats to children. The ritual repeats in various cities across the Netherlands until December 5th, the name day of St. Nicholas. Okay. Joie de Piet is according to folklore, an assistant to center clash and of Moorish descent. Traditionally, since Piet's first appearance in the children's book in 1850, Joie de Piet is portrayed as a very dark skinned character with large red lips, curly black hair, and giant hoop earrings. When Piets appear in person, they are portrayed by volunteers in blackface. So this is make this is really making fun of the Moors that they were conquered. Some are going to be enslaved, things like this. So each year there's been more and more uh, in the Netherlands. There's been more and more protests against the celebration of Joan de Piet to shut it down because they're saying this is racist. Okay, now let me go back to okay. Let me go back to this one here. I think I could close this one out. Let's go back to this one here. Okay, so we left off. Okay, let's go back to this here. We were talking about pagan. What does pagan mean? Okay, let's pull this back up. Um, I'm going to go here. What does pagan mean? Um, Just a second. Okay. No, I think it'll open back up. Here we go. Right there. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to this slide here. What does pagan mean? Um, an adherent of a polytheistic religion in antiquity, especially when viewed in contrast to an adherent of a monotheistic religion. So we, I just talked about that. Um, middle at the bottom, Middle English from late Latin Paganus. Paganus from, uh, from Latin, which means country dweller, civilian from Pagus, which means country or rural district. So in its original form, it just referred to somebody who was, it, it just referred to something that was practiced by people in a rural district, country dwellers, something that was indigenous to a group of people, okay? A practice that was indigenous to a group of people, something like that. It may be referred to like how you have people who live in the country and you may say, oh, they're in the country they, they, they may be backwards or something like this, what have you, something like that. But over time, it became to mean something very negative, pagan. But in its original form, it's not something negative. Now, where does the name Easter come from? Where does the name Easter come from? Like many other Christian feasts, the celebration of Easter contains a number of originally pagan or folk religious elements tolerated by the church, tolerated by the church. Among these are customs associated with the Easter egg, Easter breads and other special holiday foods. 
and the European concept of the Easter hare, H-A-R-E, which is an animal, a bunny, a rabbit, an Easter hare, or in America of the Easter rabbit, which brings baskets of candies and colored eggs during the night. Okay, the Easter bunny. The pagan roots of Easter involve the spring festivals of pre-Christian Europe and the Near East, which celebrate the rebirth of vegetation, welcoming the growing light as the sun becomes more powerful in its course toward summer. So it's things coming back to life. It's things, things go, you know, a lot of vegetation and, and, and the, and the, uh, uh, the leaves fall off the trees and things like this. So people wear vibrant colors, like for Easter, recognizing spring is coming back. So vegetation is going to start growing again. Things like this, the trees start budding with leaves, etc. Life is coming back. And we know that Easter comes after the first day of spring also. So it's, it's in recognition of all of that, which celebrates the rebirth of vegetation, welcoming the growth, the growing light as the sun becomes more powerful in its course towards summer. It is significant that in England and Germany, the church accepted the name of the pagan goddess Easter, Anglo-Saxon Eostra, E-O-S-T-R-A. Her name has several spellings. They accepted this for the new Christian holiday. So depending upon which European language that you're looking at, you'll see different variations of, of um, her name. All right, now let's look at... Uh, Pull that up, okay. In Mediterranean Europe, Italy, Spain, and France, Christianity adopted Pasha, a word derivative of Passover, from which comes the adjective Pasha for things pertaining to Easter, such as the Pasha lamb, the Pasha lamb. Okay, and then when we talk about Germanic, Germanic, the term Germanic is relating to a characteristic of Germany or its people, language or culture. Um, of or relating to the branch of Indo-European language family that comprises North Germanic, West Germanic, and the extent and, and the extinct Easter, East Germanic. Um when you hear the term Germanic peoples, especially during medieval times, it can also refer to the barbarians. Uh, you, you hear it also referred to as barbarians. Uh, they talk about the, the Lombards, the Jutes, the Anglos, the Saxons, the Picts, the Alans, the Franks. Um, it's, it can also be in reference to what were collectively called barbarians. Now, goddesses Eostra and Ostara. Eostra and Ostara. The name Easter may have come from Eostra or, e or Eastra or Eastra, however you pronounce it, E A S T R E, the Teutonic or Anglo Saxon goddess of spring and fertility whose feast was celebrated around the start of spring. She is associated with the hare, H-A-R-E, and egg, both symbols of creation, both symbols of creation. Astara is a uh, Germanic goddess who was always accompanied by a hare. 
possibly the ancestor of our, our modern Easter bunny. The association of both the rabbit and eggs with Easter is probably the vestige of an ancient springtime fertility rite, R-I-T-E. Uh, you can look at uh, encyclopedia.com. They have information. History.com has information on that. They talk about a star or things like this. Encyclopedia.com as well. That this particular information on goddess Eostra and a star that comes from the Gale Encyclopedia on food and culture, but they have all this information at encyclopedia.com. There are different sources for this also. So you can look at different sources, not just one. I've looked at numerous sources on this. Now, okay, Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday. What's Mardi Gras? Shrove Tuesday celebrated as a holiday in many places with carnivals, masquerade balls, and parades of costume merrymakers. Uh, Mardi Gras, a, car a carnival period uh, coming to a climax on this day, an occasion of great fest festivity and merrymaking. Ma Mardi, or Mardi, M-A-R-D-I, means Tuesday, and Gras, G-R-A-S, means fat. From the feasting, from the feasting on Mardi Gras becomes Lenten fasting, or Fat Tuesday. That's what Mardi Gras means. Okay, in French, Mardi Gras means Fat Tuesday. All right, now um, I'm gonna come to the ten plagues here in just a second. Now there's a good article from. Um, Time magazine that I was looking at, time.com. This piece right here. Here's why Easter eggs are a thing. Here's why Easter eggs are a thing. This is this was updated April 14th, 2022, originally published April 14th, 2017. You can read the entire article. I'm not going through the whole thing. This is what I want to look at here. But when it comes to Easter eggs, evidence suggests that the obvious metaphor came after the association between the holiday and the item was already established. The origin of Easter eggs starts in medieval Europe, but it may or may not have originated with Christians. According to some, the first Easter eggs actually belonged to a different religious tradition. Many scholars believe that Easter has its origins as an early Anglo-Saxon festival that celebrated the goddess Eastra, E-A-S-T-R-E, -E, and the coming of spring, in a sense, a resurrection of nature after, after winter, in a sense, a resurrection of nature after winter because things are coming back to life. Vegetation, plants, things like this are coming back to life. Carol Levin, professor of history and director of the medieval and Renaissance studies program at the University of Nebraska tells Time Magazine in an email, quote, some Christian missionaries hoped that celebrating Christian holy days at the same time as pagan festivals would encourage conversion to Christianity, especially if some of the symbols carried over. And this is what the Roman Empire did when they were conquering people. They would incorporate things that the people they were conquer conquered celebrated and incorporated that into their the various Christian celebrations. And we especially see this with Christmas. Eggs were part of the celebration of Easter. 
apparently eggs were eaten at the festival in all and also possibly buried in the ground to encourage fertility. Okay, so read the rest read the rest of this here. And we know that also rabbits are also a uh, symbol of fertility because rabbits reproduce a lot. So rabbits are also a symbol of fertility as well. Okay, so, okay, we got time. I'm going to say we got that. Uh, okay, we did that. Now, let's look at this here. I think this is the last thing. Ten plagues um, from the book of Exodus. Which one is that? Easter. Did I do that irrespective there? Uh, and then, okay, before we go to that, there was one other thing that I wanted to, okay, if we look at this one here on Easter from history.com, there was one other part on page five. This right here, this one part on page five that deals with Easter eggs. Easter traditions. I want this one right here. Easter eggs. Okay. Uh, regardless of denomination, because irrespective is not a word. Um, uh, I don't think irrespective is a word. That's a double negative. I know irregardless is not a word. But anyway. Maybe it is a word, but it sounds like a double negative. But anyway. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. I think it is. Irregardless, it's not a word. But anyway. right here there are many eastern there are many easter time traditions with roots that can be traced to non-christian and even pagan or non-religious celebrations many non-christians choose to observe these traditions while essentially ignoring the religious aspects of the celebration examples of non-religious Easter traditions include Easter eggs and related games such as egg rolling and egg decorating. It is believed that eggs represented fertility and birth in certain pagan traditions that predate Christianity. Egg decorating may have become part of an Easter uh, may have become part of the Easter celebration in a nod to the religious significance of Easter. Uh, for example, the uh, resurrection of Yeshua or Jesus or rebirth. Okay, so read the rest of that. Okay. Now, there's a good article that uh, on the Passover and even going back to, I think, 2017, I saw this article here. So we were talking about the 10 plagues. From the book of Exodus. Now, what I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Um, so, if we look at this piece here on Passover 
from history.com and let me pull this up here i have it up in um i have it up here in firefox i need to open it in google chrome so what is passover So Passover or Peshach in Hebrew is one of the Jewish religion's most sacred and widely observed holidays. In Judaism, Passover commemorates the story of the Israelites' departure from ancient Egypt, which appears in the Hebrew Bible's books of Exodus. Numbers and Deuteronomy, among other texts, Jews observe the week long festival with a number of important rituals, including a traditional Passover meal known as Seder, the removal of leavened products from their home, the substitution of matzo for bread, and the retelling of the Exodus tale. Okay, T A L E. Now, if we look at, let me see here, and I'll lay this out. Okay, for the for the sake of time, you can um, read the rest of this and talks about Moses and Pharaoh and all this stuff. And, I, and the Bible doesn't tell you which Pharaoh they're talking about, but you you can do all that. You can go through all that. Um, let me see, story. Okay, so they talk about the story of Moses, you know, all this. Um, okay, when he reaches adulthood, Moses becomes aware of his true identity and the Egyptians' brutal treatment of his fellow Hebrews. And okay, um. He kills an Egyptian slave master and escapes to the Sinai Peninsula where he lives as a humble shepherd for 40 years. One day, Moses receives a command from God to return to Egypt and free his kin from bondage. Okay. According to the Hebrew Bible. All right. Now, 10 plagues. When the Pharaoh refuses... In the story, they don't tell you which Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a title, not a name. Just saying. When the Pharaoh refuses a Nasubiti, because Nasubiti would be the correct term, God unleashes 10 plagues on the Egyptians. So God is punishing the African people. Okay. <laughs> Including turning the Nile red with blood disease livestock boils hailstorms and three days of darkness culminating in the slaying of every firstborn son by an avenging angel okay culminating in the slaying okay so you killing african children african infants the israelites however mark the door of their homes with lamb's blood so the angel of death will recognize and quote unquote pass over each Jewish household. Terrified of further punishment, the, the Egyptians can convince their ruler to release the Israelites and Moses quickly leads them out of Egypt. This is the Exodus. The Pharaoh changes his mind, however, and sends his soldiers to retrieve the former slaves. As the Egyptian army approaches the fleeing Jews at the end of the Red Sea, a miracle occurs. God causes the sea to part, okay? The parting of the Red Sea, all right? You see that in the in the, that uh, movie, uh, Ten Commandments, where they show Ramses and, and Nefertiti 
or Nefertari as, as Europeans, basically. This I posted this uh, on our Facebook fan page, uh, the African History Network, a couple of days ago. It got it got a ton of comments. Um, let me pull this thing up here. This is um, this this a historical depiction of ancient Kemetic people, ancient Egyptians. Let me go back to this here. Where is that? This is right here. Let me pull this up. So I posted this. Let me see. Hold on. This is the. Uh, Okay, we gotta slide down and pull that up here. So it was Euro Brenner and um what was her name? Ann Baxter. She was Nefertari. This right here. So I posted this on our uh, Facebook fan page, the African History Network. I said, straight up BS. These actors are portraying ancient African comedic Egyptian rulers as Europeans. This is from the Ten Commandments. So this is from, I saw this from Do You Remember When, the uh, Facebook page, Do You Remember When. So this got like 587 comments. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. So just, just more Hollywood nonsense. Now, goes on to say that this this piece here is from history.com official website of the history channel you can look at other sources as the egyptian army approaches the fleeing jews uh the fleeing jews at the edge of the red sea a miracle occurs god causes the sea to part allowing moses and his followers to cross safely then closes the passage and drowns the egyptians According to the Hebrew Bible, the Jews now numbering in the hundreds of thousands, okay, now numbering the hundreds of thousands, then trek through the Sinai Desert for 40 tumultuous years before finally reaching their ancestral home in Canaan, later known as the land of Israel. Now, really is going to be close to probably about 2 million of them roaming throughout the sinai desert for 40 years according to the story now if you go on to read this then they have a section here called questions of historical accuracy they say for centuries it's got now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness Okay. For centuries, scholars have been debating the details and historical merit of the events commemorated during the Passover holiday. Despite numerous attempts, historians and archaeologists have failed to corroborate the tale of the Jews' enslavement in and mass exodus from Egypt. Now, this is not an African-centered or Afrocentric source saying this. this. This is the History Channel. Although the ancient Egyptians kept thorough records, no mention is made of an Israelite community within their midst or any cal calamities resembling the 10 biblical plagues 
There is also no, now this is extremely important because if you had close to 2 million people roaming through the Sinai desert for 40 years, do you understand that a throw off the ecology of the desert and there still be evidence there of them today? There, there still be evidence. There still be evidence. They're going to be skeletons. There's going to be things that they buried. The question you, the question you would ask is what did almost 2 million people eat for 40 years in the desert? Where did they get water from? There is also no evidence of large encampments in the Sinai Peninsula, the fabled site of the Jews wandering, or any sudden fluctuation in Israel's record, uh, archaeological record that would indicate the departure and return of a large population. A handful of scholars, including the first Jewish historian, Josephus, have suggested a link between the Israelites and the Hyksos, the shepherd kings that invade uh, ancient Kemet, a mysterious Semitic people, possibly from Canaan, who controlled lower Kemet or Egypt for more than 100 years before the expulsion during the 16th uh, century B.C. Most modern academics, however, have dismissed this theory due to chronological conflicts and a lack of similarity between the two cultures. I'm not telling you don't celebrate these. I'm just saying understand the history behind what it is that you're celebrating. Okay. Um, <laughs> If you have a million and a half to two million people roaming through a desert for 40 years, there's going to be archaeological evidence left behind. Overwhelming. It's going to throw off the ecology. It's going to. <laughs> you, they leave. There's evidence left behind. Okay, so I don't know what to say. Okay, all right. Um, you don't have to believe a word that I say. Proper documentation ends all conversation. <laughs> you do your own research. You don't have to believe me. Okay, I'm just saying. You don't have to believe me. Um, we we did that one. That one. Up. Oh, let's look at this here. NRF dot uh, NRF dot com National Retail Federation. So when we look at when I go research these different holidays and look at the, the money that they generate. Okay. And I mean, I, I, I understand people want to buy Easter clothes and a, a new suit and dress and hat and gloves and shoes. And I, I, can, I understand that. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying understand the history behind what it is you're participating in. More consumers hunting for bargains this Easter. Uh, this is from National Retail Federation. Consumers plan to spend an average $169.79 this year on Easter-related items. According to results of the annual survey released today by the National Retail Federation and Proper Insights and Analytic Analytics, a total of 80% of Americans will celebrate the holiday and spend a collective 20 Point eight billion dollars, which is down slightly from last year's forecast of twenty point twenty one point six billion dollars. This is the type of money that's generated from Easter. Twenty point eight billion dollars. OK, now we want re, we, we want retail store. We want the economy to do well. We want African-American stores to do well, things like this. But not singling out Easter, but when I look at any of these holidays, we did the same thing for 
St. Patrick's Day, same thing for Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day, things like this. We I also go to National Retail Federation to look at what the projections are for spending. My background's in marketing, okay? So I learned about the National Retail Federation years ago. All right, so you can um, check that out also, nrf.com, National Retail Federation. Okay, so we did that, that, that. Uh, there's information, Britannica has some good information on Easter also that you can look at if you like. This one right here, um, Easter. Because I definitely look at the sources I pay money to each month. I mean, e each month. Yeah, because I have a subscription to Britannica. Um, so I use some of their information in my classes. So I had to get a subscription to them. So they have some information here on Easter. That's some good information here. Um, and you see, they talk about the venerable bead also. Yep, the English word Easter, which parallels the German word Ostern, is of uncertain origin. One view expounded by the Venerable Bede, who became Saint Bede the Venerable in the 8th century, uh, because Bede dies in, was it 735 AD he dies? I think it's like 735 735 AD, May 26, he dies, right? The Venerable Bede. Um, Venerable, the Venerable Bede in the 8th century uh, said that uh, the word Easter was derived from Eostra or Eostre, the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility. This view presumes, as does the view associating the origin of Christmas on December 25th with pagan celebrations of the winter solstice, that Christmas appropriated pagan names and holidays from the highest festivals. Okay. Uh, um, okay. So you can read the rest of this also. Okay. So we get that. We did that. I did all that. All right. We got all that, did that and Time Magazine uh, and NRF. We deal with the 10 plagues. All right. Okay. Uh, be sure if you like this type of information, you can register for the online history classes that I teach on Saturday and Sunday. So we have a new, we have some new classes starting up. Um, uh, Saturday, April 23rd. Saturday, April 23rd, um, ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. This is a 10 week online history class that I teach. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. Some of the slides that I showed you, uh, there's just a few of the slides that we use in the class because there's over 200 slides in the class. Um, and we go through and uh, look at history chronologically. We can't start studying our history in slavery. Um, we look at the uh, African presence in the Americas going back at least 51,700 years also. So we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. As soon as you register, we have some archive content that you can start watching. Uh, the class is on sale $80, regularly $130. Even after the course is over with, you can go back and watch the entire class. I just posted the link here. So as soon as you register, we got a ton of content for you to start watching. You also can get some bonus lectures uh, from me also in digital format that you can, you can stream, you can watch. And then we uh, also have another class starting up uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And that's going to be on um, Sundays, 2 p.m. to 11, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., not 2 p.m., 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. That second class, um, that's going to pick up where the first one leaves off. Okay. The second class is going to be $80, also regularly $130. Now, um, we have a bundle pack 
you can register for uh, both classes at a discount. It's a $260 value. You can register for both classes for uh, $120, okay? So click right there, register here. This is on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, and um, you'll get a uh, you get a fifty percent discount. All right, in in these classes, we look at uh, we go through we look at history chronologically. There's a timeline of history that we look at. Uh, we can't start studying our history in slavery even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study. We can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s when the Portuguese uh, get involved. Uh, we have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who enter into the Iberian Peninsula in 711 AD, the day known as Spain and Portugal uh, from Africa to going from Morocco. This, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in this course, we, we not only deal with the transatlantic slave trade, but we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with the African presence in the Americas going back over 50,000 years in South America, going back at least 56,000 years ago. And in the land we call the United States of America, going back at least 51,700 years ago. Okay. And that deals with uh, uh, the Khoisan um, and Dr. David M. Hotep deals with this in his book, uh, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. And we know the Khoisan had the oldest DNA on the planet, that the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. Uh, they come from Southern Africa, they go all around the world. And uh, page uh, 14 of his book deals with the discovery made in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, which thoroughly documents an African presence in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. This is before Native Americans came into existence. Um, Dr. Albert Goodyear found 13 different types of evidence documenting an African presence in the area we call South Carolina. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, scales, uh, linguistics, paintings, uh, uh, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence documenting an African presence. Okay, so uh, you can also use that with your children as well. Uh, the class, I would say, is PG-13, both of them. Uh, that one in from the civil war to the civil rights movement to black power 1865 and 1968. okay so you can register for those and um also if you'd like this type of information you support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting pay some of the bills etc all right and uh we have the information on our website and here's the link also. And when you go to our cash app account, it'll say Michael and show my picture there also. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember the African History Network, uh, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct your own behavior. Uh, Monday through Friday, basically I'm on uh, 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time. The African History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we have the information here uh, on our website. Also, we're celebrating our 12th year anniversary anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. First started March 10th, 2010. It, and it's been six years of me doing it on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Uh, download the iHeartRadio app. Search for the African History Network show. They have about 300 of my audio podcasts there. Of my shows and broadcasts you can also you can also listen to 9 10 a.m superstation wfdf through the iHeartRadio app uh, as well you can listen to me there live 
or watch me on Facebook and YouTube, the, the African History Network on Facebook and Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, you focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring the African people, uh, people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Oh, I got to tell you about the uh, Hop Heat Conference. Uh, so I've been talking about this, and it's going on uh, in Detroit. Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor Jane Small will be here. I'm wearing my Hop Heat shirt. Hop Heat is one of the original names for the Nile River. Uh, got to tell you about this. The Power on One Conference, Power on One Unity Conference, Saturday, April 30th, uh, 2022, Double Tree Hotel in Detroit, uh, Sunday, May 1st. We have three of my teachers going to be here uh, doing presentations. Dr. Lynn Jeffries, Professor Jane Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamane. Uh, then we also had Dr. Roslyn Jeffries, uh, uh, Dr. Ma Mawulana Karinga, um, Infidushi uh, uh, Jehutimas, we should have him on the show this week. Uh, Jabari Osazi, Asar M. Hotep, I think we have him on the show also. Asar M. Hotep, Dr. Ken Harris, they're all going to be doing presentations. Um, Shaharazad Ali, Dr. Alicia Watkins, they'll all be doing presentations. I'm not sure if I'm, I think I may be on one of the panels or something. Uh, I'll be a vendor there though as well. This is taking place at the Double Tree Hotel. We're going to post the link here. We'll put this on our website also. If you can't come in person, you can live stream this from around the world. Okay, this is the Power and Unity Conference. So if you can't come in person, that's fine. Not a problem. You can live stream it from around the world. We're going to post the link here. And it ha uh, has the link for you to register. All right, we got that. And um, we'll put that on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the homepage, so you can register there as well. All right, we have to get out of here. Right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing costs, which can be thousands of dollars. They close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing. They take the property in an as is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs. Give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs. Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook.